Well, good afternoon. Thank you for, to, for all coming to our um, last SDG at three discussion. We've had uh, several over this course of this year and we will continue them next year. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'm Heidi Hobbs. I'm the Director of Faculty Engagement in the Office of Global Engagement. I'm also a political science professor uh, in the School of Public and International Affairs. So we're happy to have you here. I'll introduce our guest in a moment, but I wanted to at least tell you a little bit about what we do here and a little bit about the sustainable development goals as, as relates to our interests and activities. Our workshops feature faculty members and student group uh, representatives and sometimes practitioners to help you understand how you can become engaged with the SDGs. And you can see, to keep up sort of with what we've got going on, go ncstate.edu SDG. So what are the sustainable development goals? There are 17 goals designed to transform our world. We have been taking them in chunks for each semester to address. And here's the layout of how we have been looking at them. So we looked at quality of life in the fall semester. We're looking at environmental responsibility here at this spring, and we'll look at 14 life below water and 15 life on land today. We hope you'll join us in the fall. Those of you who are not graduating, if you're graduating, go back. Um, <laughs> equity and equal opportunity we'll have in the fall, and then prosperity for all in the spring of 2023. We look at number 17, which is partnerships over the whole course of our programming. So what are the ones that we're looking at today? I don't wanna steal any of our speaker's thunder, but I wanna give you at least a little bit of information to get started. Goal 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. The healthy oceans and seas cover 70% of our planet. And so we rely on them for food, energy, and water. But it's a precious resource and one that we must protect. And so we'll hear from Astrid Snetzer, who's an associate professor in marine earth and atmospheric sciences about some more specific issues related to goal 14. There are specific, in each of the sustainable development goals, there are specific targets and those targets give room to identify how to achieve them by 2030. And uh, I think they'll pick up on some of those in the presentations. And this is a little graphic that shows you some of the challenges and some of the solutions, which is kind of cool, comes from the United Nations. It also points out that the sustainability of our oceans is under severe threat by climate change, uh, acidification, fishery collapse. So we have a lot of issues that we really are trying to address. And much of the world is revolves around small scale fisheries. And that really has had a significant impact over time. So this is again, a graphic telling you a little bit about some of the issues. The other goal that we'll come check into today is goal 15. And goal 15 is to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. That's a lot, huh? <laughs> but deforestation, loss of natural habitats, and land degradation we know is going on all around us and is an important issue that we need to address. Interestingly, both of these 14 and 15 are dealing with earth issues and the Earth Day is coming up on April 21st. So it sort of fits in with, with what we're thinking about. Again, as I pointed out, each of the sustainable development goals has specific targets to address by 2030. And again, we have a graphic from them about how can we deal with uh, the loss of, of land due to climate change specifically and dry and arable lands that are, are no longer available due to drought and desertification. Uh, how can we restore forests? 
And how can we restore biodiversity as well? And what we know is that specifically with many species, they are threatened with extinction. We know that there has been some uh, effort towards sustainable forest management, and we might hear a little bit about that, but there are still a lot to do. Now, as I said, we have uh, three panelists with us today. Dr. Astrid Schnetzer, uh, who I mentioned earlier, Dr. Meredith Martin, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources in the College of Natural Resources, and Caroline Brannon is here to tell us a little bit about a student organization dealing with marine sciences and uh, ways that you can get involved. So I'm going to turn it over to Astrid and let you take over. And you have to stop me because 10 minutes is a very small period of time. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Let's <laughs> get started. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Astrid Schnitz. Am I loud enough or do I need to be? You can hear me, right? Okay. Um, so it was a little challenging uh, just to the goals and then figuring out what to talk about in 10 minutes. And I'm trying to just pick one little thing that we're actually doing in my lab to look at sustainable solutions and some of the things that threaten our coastal environments. Um, so what we do in my research lab is we look at the small stuff. We don't look at the charismatic white sharks and the larger organisms. We look at the things you need a microscope for. But guess what? You already know this. If we wouldn't have that at the base of the food web, there would be absolutely nothing we can fish out of the oceans. You should also be very aware the reason that you're breathing is also uh, coming from uh, phytoplankton and microbes that actually invented photosynthesis and the oxygen that we rely on comes from these little organisms. So we work with plankton, which are small microscopic plants or animals. They're like, when I say small, Think about the thinnest of your hair, slice it a couple of times, that's how small they are. But there's millions and billions of them in the ocean. And if you jump in and you swallow a uh, spoonful of organisms, about five mils, this is what you get with it. Most of that doesn't do anything to you. As you know, your digestive system is pretty destructive for little organisms, but some of these critters can be harmful, and that's what I want to talk about. So when you hear algal blooms, typically people go like, ooh, bad things. Well, no, algal blooms are a natural cycle. They're at the base of the food web. It's what trees and terrestrial plants do for terrestrial systems. If we wouldn't have algae again, and those primary producers, we would actually not have anything that's larger. Um, these are some of those beautiful organisms. If you like critters uh, and you like microscopy, you should definitely check this out at some point. Uh, what we're looking at is who is there, who's eating who, how does that transfer uh, energy up the food web, and how does it actually also impact full scale ecosystem processes and functionality. So the problem is, I'm going to click in here right now, is that we're unbalancing these systems, right? It comes back to what we put in the ocean, and that's very tightly related to urbanization, to land use, and terrestrial goals. Ends up in there, and as you know, what plants need is nutrients, light, and water. And we're giving them plenty of that. Phosphate, nitrogen, and all that stuff, it all ends up in our coastal waters, and it allows some of these species to really flourish and produce excess biomass. And then you get these slimes or these red tides in coastal systems or these greenish slimes in freshwater systems. Here, I don't want to go through it all, but you see some of the processes that contribute to this. And we also know that the uh, people move to the oceans, to coastal waterways, so getting these issues with sewage treatment plants, urban runoff, and so forth, that's not going anywhere. And some of the newest studies show that paired with climate change, that systems that are already overloaded with nutrients are likely going to be the ones that are going to have excessive uh, issues with harmful algal blooms along the way. All right, so one of the most famous um, examples that you probably came across in some classrooms, the Gulf of Mexico and the dead zone there, what happens is that you have all these nutrients that make it into the waterways, into the watershed, and then with river discharge, into the Gulf. So here's like 90% of the nitrogen load comes from non point sources, which also makes it really hard to try back and mitigate 
and control those sources. So it's not an easy issue. Why does it go anoxic? Well, you have all these biomass, all this phytoplankton, all these algae growing. At some point, they run out of fuel. They start to degrade. Bacteria come in and remineralize that biomass. And what do bacteria do? They respire. So you suddenly get all this oxygen sort of sucked out of the water column, especially in shallow and baymans and coastal waters. And that creates these huge anoxic zones in coastal areas all over the globe. They're increasing along the California coast. They're very well understood uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. But this is a real issue. We don't actually have to go that far because you know that you also have fish kills in the Noose River that are actually often associated with algal blooms. Here's just a quick look at how we're trying to figure out where these sources come from. So if you look at the pie chart closest to us, you see in different colors, as you would expect, green to red, uh, how well preserved or how healthy any surface or any area with river and stream environment is. And you can tell as far as phosphate load is concerned, there's a lot of improvement that is needed. So now that you know the sources and what's going on, why do we care? Well, I already talked about uh, fish kills and anoxia. People do not want to live at places that are stinky, where there's that fish, where there's discoloration of the water and whatnot. But then we have on top of that, some of those algae that actually produce toxins. And that is when we get really concerned about these issues because the toxins can make it into the food web. In this case, you see this green slime, never let your dog in any water that looks that color. It can be toxic, okay? And also you stay away from it. Um, you might not know that there's actually toxins associated, but why, why challenge that notion, all right? This can happen in form of red tides in marine systems, but here you see a couple of uh, issues in a, in a freshwater system. What happens to these toxins is that they're filtered, they're accumulated over the food web, and somewhere at the end of this food, uh, food web are us, right? We like our sushi, we like our fish and whatnot, we like our shellfish. And that's why many of those toxin poisons are actually called by the symptom they're causing humans, amnesic shellfish poisoning, paralytic shellfish poisoning. And yes, those toxins do exactly that, that cause those sorts of symptoms. There's also some uh, toxins that might actually be aerosolized and they can cause issues when people breathe them. Um, it's getting worse. So you see a map right here, if you're interested, the World's Whole Oceanographic um, Institute has a wonderful website with these different kinds of toxin events. What you see pre-1972, all these different colors are uh, indicated with different types of uh, toxic events associated with different algae producing different toxins. And you can see that in present, there's way more of these in way more places. So this is a indicative of we're getting better in monitoring them and detecting them, but it also has to do with us putting all these nutrients into our waterways. And there's a lot of research right now going on what it does for the water and for those blooms in regard to temperatures increasing, ocean acidification and things like that. All right, you might have heard about this uh, cold state in North Carolina that is starting to create an issue, especially in freshwater, but it goes all the way up to recent study in the Arctic, all the way up to the Beaufort Sea, where they just took mammal samples and they looked in different tissue types and urine and feces and they actually found toxins all the way up to the uh, 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 Arctic waters. What you might be more familiar with is the Florida tide that can have huge impacts and sometimes uh, lasts for months on end. And some of the organisms that are uh, affected on the West Coast with uh, the first example that I showed you go all the way up to sea lions, pelicans, benthic organisms because these algae can also sink to the bottom and then get uh, uh, consumed with the toxins. If it takes out a 400 pound sea lion, you might have want to pay attention to that, right? right? Because they eat fish, they eat vectors that we could be affected by too. And then we have things like the manatees. They have taken a lot of hits from the Florida tide. And if you see the gentleman up there collecting fish on the, on the beach, he has something around his face. Uh, the Florida red tide is also a real issue because it can aerosolize and uh, cause issues in people that way. It's not asthma problems, um, long respiratory issues. All right, so this is the big issue, the smoking gun. They're there, we're trying to detect them. 
But the good thing is, what we can do and what we do in the lab is because we now have all these wonderful detection methods, we can actually start to get a grip on it. What we do is we identify which algae and which toxins are in any kind of environment. We look at where and when they start to take hands or, or are favored and take over, right? Because there might be a certain river discharge, uh, additional nutrients, there might be a certain temperature in the water that is uh, suddenly proliferating these types of toxic algae. And then we're trying to figure out where it's going. Is it washed from freshwater into coastal oceans? Is it going into the food web? Where are these toxins going? So we can actually help predict the risk from those toxins, <coughs> mitigate them, and most importantly, start conversations with people who are uh, in policy and try to figure out nutrient management plans, the people that are actually in charge to regulate some of these uh, uh, river discharge, uh, water, storm water, and whatnot. We can tell them what to look for and when to get a better idea of what the issue is in any specific area. And most importantly, we can actually then give them an idea of what they would look like in what kind of food sources, what are you consuming, and what should you be looking out when. So if you eat, for example, oysters, so a lot of people who like oysters ask where they come from, right? There's half monitoring websites. There is one at the DQ site, Department of Environment Quality. We work a lot with them. You can figure out if they're coming from an area that is okay. I'm almost done. I know I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, you're um, fascinating. <laughs> what really helps with all this, getting this qualitative and quantitative information, and much of that actually comes from going out into the community and talking to them, right? We're sampling all over North Carolina. We wouldn't be able to do this just coming from campus, but our lab and my students get calls from uh, environmental groups. They get uh, calls from people who know we're doing this work. We get calls from people who are doing uh, normal monitoring and they tell us, listen, Turin River, near so-and-so, Colorant, we see it, there is a bloom. So we can be alerted to that and go out there, provide them with what they need to sample for us and have this exchange, which is really important in regard to starting to tackling some of these issues. Also, you might be surprised that a lot of these toxins that we're getting, we don't actually really have good health advisory guidelines yet for. Because as long as we don't know what toxins are there when, we can't do the epidemiology studies that tell us what kind of effect they have on humans. And as long as we don't have that, we can tell you as soon as it is this high for this toxin, stay away. Close the shellfish, close fisheries. Does that make sense? So there's a lot that we can do, but just going out there and establishing these patterns and learning from that, that can help. Well, brings me to my last slide. What is your role? What can you do? I just told you in more than 10 minutes, I apologize, mm -hmm. that <laughs> nutrients are the main issue. What can any of us in this room do to get at that? Yeah. Citizen science, maybe reporting out you blooms when you see them in different areas. Report problems, absolutely. And also algae blooms, yes. And there's reporting sites, which I should have put on the, but I can't provide that information. <laughs> what else? In your day-to-day -day life. Don't overthink it. What are you doing day to day that might introduce nutrients into coastal waterways? Yeah. Just regular pollution, but not cleaning up after yourself. Not cleaning up after yourself. When do you use soap? In what context do you use soap in your life? At your house. At your house. What do you do? You wash. Dishwasher, washing machine washing your car in the driveway, all of that stuff is making it into our coastal waters, all of it. All of that stuff ends up, there's treatment plans, there's some sort of treatment processes, but there's always something left that makes it all the way to those uh, places. You can do a lot by not over fertilizing your lawn, by not leaving clippings and making it into drains, by being very acute and protective of coastal waterways and coastal ecosystems. Why? Because marsh grows because it takes the nutrients out of these waterways, filters them out, and then they don't make it all the way into the coast. So there's really simple things that you can do. And here's a couple. Coastal ecosystems. Marsh loves nutrients. It's bad it goes into seagrass, then it's going into the coastal waterways where the algae can use it. Your garden. 
don't water extensively and use native uh, knowledge to actually grow things that don't need too much fertilizer, right? Very straightforward. Don't do this. If you actually see somebody in your neighborhood <laughs> and you feel brave enough, address it. There's a reason why water or, or water treatment is mandatory if you bring your car to washer station. They have to treat whatever comes from your car after it's done. Um, Eco-friendly detergents, dishwashers and whatnot. At that point, you can also do a double backup on not using plastic, right? Which is another huge um, elephant in the room. And then the other thing is, and I really, really say that this is one of the things that you have the most influence in is vote for people who care about the Clean Water Act. And if there's changes, call your representative and ask them why on earth are we loosening clean water regulations? Now that we've learned about all these threats and all what's going on, shouldn't we go the other way, define them and upgrade them and make sure that they're actually adhered to? Right? You can make a huge difference in that regard. So be brave, ask questions, and talk to people about it, address them, and seem that you weren't quite sure where those nutrients are coming from, spread the word where they're coming from, and you'll be amazed how much difference can be made. And that's it. Great. Thank you. Oh, and that's all the people who do the hard work. It's not, <laughs> I'm just here to talk. Yeah. Okay, well, that's very interesting, and we, we learned quite a bit. Uh, uh, Meredith Martin is, as I said, assistant professor in the uh, Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources, and she's going to give you a different view from land. Okay. Your first slide? Yeah. Okay. No, that is just some extras. Okay. All the way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. There Here we go. We go. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, also intimidating from a land perspective to figure out how to talk about uh, protecting all of these things, restoring all these things in 10 minutes. So um, I'm not sure whether I'll go short or long. Fine. We'll see you do what you can. Um, no. But so I, I, uh, I'm an assistant professor here. I just started about a year ago. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about a range of research that I do. And then at the end, talk a little bit, get a little bit of a plug for some classes that I'm teaching that I would love to get some more enrollment in. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two, two main topics that are a focus of research that, that I do, my lab does. One is community forest management and the other is tropical restoration, tropical reforestation. I did have this in here just in case we weren't gonna <laughs> talk good. about it. Uh, but so this, this, you know, SDG goal to protect, restore, promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, um, halt biodiversity loss. Um, all of these things are very um, intimately tied in with promoting good forest management, figuring out what good forest management is, um, and then also figuring out how we can balance conservation of biodiversity with also the production of all of these um, goods and services and things that forests can provide. And how can we do that in a way um, that is also beneficial to human society and that is promoting human rights and social justice. Um, and to me, this is really where community-based forest management can play a really key role. So um, I work a lot in the tropics and subtropics, also in urban and temperate systems, but. Um, a lot of this is sort of coming from that, um, that zone. And so traditionally, uh, say in the sort of 70s, 80s, um, when we started to realize that we were losing all this biodiversity, that there was all this deforestation happening in the tropics, the gut level response was, well, we have to get people out of the forests and we have to have people stop using the forests. Um, and, you know, you can see there's a logic to that, right? People are maybe cutting firewood, maybe they're clearing some areas for agriculture. Um, but it's a very limited strategy from a lot of perspectives, right? Just in terms of effectiveness, the amount of area that we can contain in protected areas is just small compared to the amount of tropical forest that exists. But from another perspective, in a lot of these places, the very people that were being kicked out of the land were the people who had been stewarding the land for centuries or millennia. Um, and so the idea that, you know, we need to get these indigenous communities out of here, but let's ignore that mining concession and that logging concession um, is just sort of absurd. So, 
slowly the dial is kind of shifting towards an understanding that local people um, not only deserve to have some uh, say over what's happening to their forests, um, but also that including local people is actually just much more effective ultimately in whatever the goal is. So the basic tenet of community-based management, community-based forest management, is that local people have some level of control over forest management. And studies have found that actually when we do this, when communities have control over forests on a global scale, these community forests are more effective at decreasing deforestation compared even to protected areas. So not compared to like logging concessions, they're way more effective than logging concessions, but even compared to protected areas, places, forests where communities have control are better at avoiding deforestation. And they've also found that the amount of success the amount of sort of sustainability in forest management is really tied to the amount of control that people have. So if people actually have tenure rights and have an understanding that my kids and my grandkids are gonna have control over this forest, there's a lot more incentive to maintain that forest sustainably. And one thing that I personally really enjoy about working with community-based management is there's often a much more holistic focus on forest products. So many communities are managing for timber, but there's also often a, a really uh, interesting focus on non-timber forest products. So fruits, medicines, firewoods, um, all these other things that actually can have quite high commercial values, quite high cultural values, quite high um, social values. And I think it's really important to start integrating that into our understanding of forest management. So uh, one of my roles in being involved in community management is bringing sort of Western scientific tools to help support communities in monitoring and in understanding what's sort of the status of their resources. Um, and so this is using sort of basic forestry, silvicultural tools, getting understanding of sort of the stock of the resource with forest inventories, getting understandings of sort of the sustainable yield, looking at growth rates, looking at regeneration, um, and then using some of these simple tools. These are um, size class diagrams uh, that show sort of for different tree species, the number of seedlings and saplings and bigger and bigger, bigger trees that you have. And so using these tools as a way for communities to get a quick snapshot of um, is there a way to do an arrow um, of saying, oh, look, you know, we've got lots of big trees and lots of regeneration. This resource is doing really, really well. Our current strategy is working really well. Or saying, oh, we're, we're really not getting much regeneration. Maybe we need to change our management a little bit or, or start doing something else. Um, and so really sort of simple, basic forestry tools can be really useful as a sort of addition to whatever existing traditional knowledge is already in place. And can also be a way to, for communities to kind of communicate with governments or with other agencies to show, hey, we know what we're doing and, and we have a management plan and, and all of these things. So I've had the opportunity to um, work on a number of different products using these sort of basic ecology forestry techniques. And I'm not going to go into them, but I just wanted to highlight that, um, you know, again, with community forestry, there's a wide range of products that you can work on, which is really fun. So um, I've done work with this Kamu Kamu berry, this gentleman in a canoe. This is a berry in Peru that has the highest amount of vitamin C concentration of any known fruit or vegetable. So um, if you get like natural vitamin C supplements, sometimes they're actually made out of dried Kamu Kamu. Um, I've done some work in Myanmar community forestry. Um, these slides on the far right was a project that was using these same tools, but instead of with trees or shrubs, you were looking at agave, which is used to make mezcal. So um, the gentleman on the top is showing off. He's a uh, master mezcalero making mezcal, which is a, similar to tequila, which obviously none of you are familiar with. <laughs> 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 and then most recently, um, I've done more work in, in Mexico working on um, uh, forests that are used both for timber and non-timber, so for, for pine timber, which obviously we're familiar with in North Carolina, and then with oak firewood. Um, and again, it's uh, 
I think, a really valuable way of using our scientific expertise and sort of complementing what communities are already knowing how to do and already doing, um, and being able to have an exchange of knowledge and a support for um, groups that are already interested in sustainably managing their forests, in many cases already doing it. In this study, we found um, that the even though they were very actively harvesting pine, very actively harvesting oak for um, firewood, that the biodiversity of both oak and pine was higher than we found in some national parks nearby. So um, there's a lot of ways for these to be very synergistic when they're done thoughtfully and, and carefully. Um, of course, there are a lot of areas where the forests are already gone were already degraded through um, a number of different problems. It could be large scale mining, it could be logging, ranching, palm oil plantations. There's a huge range of reasons, unfortunately, why tropical forests have been destroyed and degraded. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that we should really care about this. So tropical forests contain half of the world's above ground carbon, which is a lot considering they are not half of the world's land area. Um, in addition to just storing that carbon, they actively are sequestering up to 15% of global carbon emissions, which is also staggering considering the oceans and all of these other things that are really sucking up carbon as well. And then in addition to their sort of role in climate change, they house nearly two thirds of the world's biodiversity. Also crazy, right? And just to give you a quick example, um, in all of Europe, there are about 124 species of trees in the tropics. How many, how many species of trees do you think there are? So 124 in all of Europe. What, 500? Yeah, about 50,000, right. just trees, right? Not even talking about ferns and orchids and lianas and all of these things. Right? So pretty incredible systems. Um, but they are, again, rapidly disappearing. So this is a map showing in green sort of the forest area. Um, and in purple, it's showing loss of trees. This is from Global Forest Watch. Um, but they estimate in 2015, they estimated that less than half of the world's tropical forests remain. So realizing this has been a big sort of clarion call for the world to try to figure out all right, well, we want to conserve what's left, but also we want to try to restore what's gone because there is all this carbon and all these ecosystem services that have been lost and can we find a way to sort of get them back? Um, and so there have been very ambitious ecosystem restoration goals. UN has called this the um, decade of ecosystem restoration. Um, all of these countries have committed to restoring millions and millions of hectares. Um, so all of this, is really positive, really exciting to, to he, he see these commitments to trying to restore these systems. Um, there have been papers talking about if we can restore these trees, we'll be able to fight climate change. A trillion trees could actually cancel out all of the carbon emissions. Um, and so there's been a lot of sort of popular media excitement about, oh, we just need to plant all these trees and we'll solve climate change is it's really not as simple as just let's plant trees everywhere, right? Anybody who's ever been involved in planting trees, even just in your backyard, they don't always survive, right? And that's in a very small scale system where you know where we are. If we're thinking about across the tropics as a whole, as soon as you think beyond let's restore more trees, the questions just multiply, right? Where exactly should we restore them? What species should we use? Do we actually need to plant them? Can we use natural regeneration? Are there other methods that we can use? Um, how are we gonna ensure that there's biodiversity involved in this? Where are we gonna get the seed sources? Who is gonna plant them? Who's gonna take care of them, right? The questions sort of go on and on and on once you dig into the details. And so this, this is sort of a topic that I've become more and more interested in thinking about and working on is, um, these are great ambitious goals, but when we get down to the details, what are we actually doing? And is that effective? So we just did some research recently looking at um, tree planting projects that are working in the tropics all around the world. And we found that overall, um, most tree planting projects are using 
sort of agroforestry systems, silvopasture, timber plantations, very few are kind of relying on natural regeneration or things like that. And we found that by far the most common species being used and being talked about were commercial species. So things like uh, coffee, which is shown here, cacao, mango, teak. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Combining commercial products, economic support for local communities with reforestation is an admirable goal. But there are, of course, going to be a lot of trade-offs, right? If we're thinking about carbon sequestration, that little coffee shrub is not going to sequester as much carbon as a big tree would, right? Um, if we're thinking about biodiversity, using this same suite of maybe 10 commercial species all over the globe has the potential to really kind of homogenize our tropical systems and make them um, much less diverse than they might be if we were using more sort of natural regeneration techniques. So I think that there's a, a lot more work um, that needs to be done in kind of figuring out, A, what's actually happening on the ground, uh, B, is it working, um, and C, what could we maybe do better? So that's kind of where my research is heading in the future. Um, and then I just wanted to make some, some quick plugs for some classes that I'm teaching. Um, so in the spring semester, I teach a, a 408 and a 508 section. It's currently called hardwood management because that was what the old course was called. Um, but it's really a much broader course. We're renaming it soon. I um, mean, it's really thinking about um, ecological silviculture, so forest management applied to natural systems. Um, but within it, we do talk about agroforestry. We do talk about restoration, um, silvopasture, and we do talk a little bit about indigenous silviculture as well. Um, as well as talking about within North Carolina, how are all these things playing out. I also am teaching a tropical forestry class, alternate years. This is a graduate level course, although I'm planning to add a 400 level to it. Um, and here we really sort of talk about the history of forestry in the tropics. Um, as you can imagine, there have been some really terrible mistakes that we keep making over and over again. Uh, so we talk about that. We talk about indigenous traditional systems there as well. Um, and then sort of more modern issues, including jackal reforestation and restoration issues. Um, and then I'm going to also be teaching a conservation of biodiversity course. Um, this will be in the fall semester, although not next fall, since I'm very pregnant. Um, <laughs> uh, but that one will be a little bit broader. But as you can imagine, we will definitely have a focus on the tropics just based on how much diversity is in those systems. So, all right, nice. great, thank you. So we've learned two different ways to get involved. Here's a third way to get involved, uh, student group. Hi everyone, so my name is Caroline. Um, just a little background, I'm a senior undergraduate double majoring in marine sciences and biological sciences. What? NC State Marine Science Club isn't just, just to put this out there, it isn't just for marine science club majors. We're a very diverse group. Um, just to give you guys a little background on this club, we're very new. Um, two dear friends of mine started this club about two years ago, right before the pandemic hit. So as you can, as you can imagine, it was a little hard to get uh, to get it up and running, but we were able to gain a lot of interest and we've been growing ever since. Um, and right now I am, I'm acting as a project manager. So I take on, I take on a project each semester and I very much like what we're talking about today. I try and use it to promote sustainability in our marine ecosystems and just kind of, um, further our objectives that we have in the marine science club. So speaking of our objectives, one of the main things, well, when I came to NC State, I really wanted, I really thought there'd be like a very fun marine science, marine biology club. I remember coming and touring and they were like, oh, we have hundreds of clubs. Like this is so interesting. We have such a diverse group of interests and like there's so many people that are eager to start clubs. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> that's like that's very interesting but where's one for this so i was very i was very fortunate to know that we have that i was i was able to be a part of founding the marine science club um and so here 
I have listed some of our objectives that we work on to, you know, achieve our global goal that we've been talking about today. And a lot of them overlap as I'm gonna talk about, but our first one is promoting marine science awareness across campus. Um, marine science program is, I would say fairly small and compared to some of our other programs that are world known. Um, but I think it's very important since the ocean is such an incredibly, well, lucrative, but also very valuable resource I think it's important to spread awareness to, to students, colleagues, faculty, and that's one of the main reasons why we're here. Um, another objective we have is sharing knowledge about our marine ecosystem. Um, in the marine science program, we learn a lot in our classes, but like I said, not everyone in marine science club is a marine science major. Everyone's coming from different backgrounds, and so through sharing knowledge and also learning not just from not just from our classes but from ourselves really enriches our knowledge and can give us good ideas to what we can do to help preserve our oceans. Another objective I have listed is making a positive impact in our marine environments. And so when I say positive impact, when thinking about this, I was mostly thinking of like physical impacts, like what can I go and do? If I go outside, what can I do to help save our oceans? But I realized a lot of it isn't just going out and doing things. It's also taking in information, you know, overlapping with the sharing knowledge and just like learning and coming up with ideas and stuff like that. Another objective or our last objective we have is helping students establish a career in marine science. So marine science kind of has this stigma that it's it's very popular, but also that there's like not a lot of jobs out there. And so we're kind of here to prove like there are actually many different job opportunities in this field and there are many different ways that we can make an impact on our oceans. So for the rest of this presentation I'm mostly just going to be showing you guys photos of how Marine Science Club is fulfilling these objectives. So as I said we were a very small club in the beginning of 2019 and you know the way we could prom promote awareness was we had to get our name out there and so these are taken in I would say fall of 2021, so literally last semester, when we could finally advertise in person, and we were just we're promoting Marine Science Club, and we got a ton of members. There was so much, so much excitement, so much interest, and I think it really gave us a great. It gave me an incredible. How should I say this? I felt I just felt very proud in that moment to know that, you know, there aren't just this little this little group that we have it can be so much more and there are so many people that are interested in preserving our oceans so going to sharing knowledge our club does we take a lot of opportunity to learn more about our ecosystems and learn more about the issues that are going on so as you can see with the left pictures the top left and the bottom left um, we took a field trip over to Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort, North Carolina, and we were learning about, well, Bonehenge Whale Center is an education center that houses re-articulated marine mammal skeletons. And so um, Keith Rittmaster, the curator, he was able to talk to us about how he put these skeletons together, but also how he came to acquire them. He didn't just like well, I guess he kind of did just find them, but it's not like people handed him this like like random bones and were like, oh, here, make this. Him and his wife responded to what are called marine mammal strandings on the coast of North Carolina. And those marine mammal strandings, while some of the time, well, a stranding is when, if, for those who don't know, a stranding is when um, a marine mammal does not have the energy to swim on its own. And so the current and waves end up washing it on shore. And if it's not helped, it usually dies. So we were learning about all the impacts about marine mammals and well, how they impact our ecosystem, but also how they are an incredible danger from fishing, from boating, and a lot of other human activities. Uh, we also were able to take a trip, a trip to the Pine Knoll Shores Aquarium, and we were able to learn about aquaculture practices and also just you know, learn a lot about the endangered species that are in our oceans and learn about more ways that we can, you know, be aware of what we are putting out into 
our ecosystem, like Dr. Schnitzer was talking about earlier. Um, we've also talked about, we've also held seminars on scuba diving and other, and other skills that we may need as students to um, move forward in the workplace. So here we have pictured one of our members. Um, she took this, she actually took the scuba diving course here at NC State, both the open water and advanced. And she actually ended up getting her scientific diving certification. And so with that, you can conduct research underwater, which to me, that sounds like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> so positive impacts. Um, as I, as I've, I've been talking a lot, and I think it's a common saying that actions speak louder than words. So one of our things where we go out into the community and make a difference, our main event has been trash cleanups. Um, and as you can see, most of these have been at our coast, as you can, in some of them. Um, and if you look at the top left, that was um, one of our most successful beach cleanups. We took a ferry over to Cape Lookout and we picked up over 20 bags of trash. You can see that huge pile of marine debris in the back. And we were there all day just picking up plastic, styrofoam, so many things, balloons. There are so many things that are out there that you don't realize can get into our marine ecosystems and can have an impact on the environment. And so while most of these are coastal and on land, one of the things that we want to push for in the Marine Science Club is to not just have them be coastal. We want to do some lake cleanups around Lake Raleigh, Lake Johnson, Lake Jordan, Falls Lake, you know, really expand our horizons more inland. And then also we have um, come into contact with opportunities of going on boats and literally fishing plastic out of the ocean through the Plastic Ocean Project in North Carolina. So th that's some exciting stuff that we have coming up. Now, moving on to establishing careers, um, North Carolina actually has an incredible network for marine science and oceanography and stuff like that. So I'm going to give a little highlight to NC State's um, own marine facility. We have the Center of, for Marine Sciences and Technologies, or CMAST. Um, they're an incredible research facility that works with so many different other organizations as they have in the bottom left. We have Sea Grant, um, yeah, which so I know a few people who are involved with that here in Raleigh. Um, and you know, we work with our rivals, UNC, but they do incredible work and it's really important that <laughs> we save our oceans and not really worry about a basketball ri rivalry in times like these. <laughs> um, and so CMAS provides incredible opportunities for research, not just for faculty, but for students. Um, I was able to go, spring of 2021, I was able to go out to um, CMAS and spend the semester there with a few other members from the Marine Science Club. And we were able to take incredible classes that really gave, they gave us better ideas of how to promote sustainability throughout. Um, throughout our lives and also sparked a lot of interest as to what we really wanted to do because a lot of us came into this a lot of us came into this program or this club and we were like we want to make an impact but it took us a while to realize what specifically we wanted to do and so CMAS really helped us with that we've also had incredible speakers come in and they've shared with us um, their jobs and, and their work and what they have done to promote sustainability. And not only just that, they've told us about their experience and how they have been moving through their education. And we've heard some pretty crazy stories. It's definitely not linear. And you know, as, a, as an undergrad, that definitely provides me some comfort that, you know, the world is kind of crazy, just like our, just like the state of our oceans. But if you put your mind to it, you can get there and you can really do your part. And then last but not least on the slide, I know there's a lot. Um, Marines, the Marine Science Club was able to have this incredible opportunity to be a part of this workshop called Creating Solutions for the Global Blue Economy. So in summary, we were workshopping ideas as to how we can come up with more sustainable practices or sustainable business plans that can promote circulation of the blue economy but like I said before, they have to remain sustainable and promote 
um, safe use of our oceans. And so that was an that was an incredible inspiration for many of our members. And we were able to come up with incredible ideas that we can now workshop for the future and work with business people to make to make a difference. In short. <laughs> So with that, um, thank you very much. If you have any questions about Marine Science Club, feel free to talk to me. Um, our our, we have a lot of social media. Our Instagram is NCSU Marine Science Club, which as you can see in our logo. Um, and we also have an email list and a group me if anyone's interested in joining. So thank you. Great. So we've heard some great stuff here and I know you have questions. So uh, I open the floor up and you can ask any of our presenters a question or something, thoughts that you're thinking about or want to know more about. Okay, so I will ask a question that maybe I'll get it going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interested in the relationship between Professor Spencer's work and what you guys are doing. Have you had uh, connections between your research group and the Marine Science Club? Well, I can say that one of our officers is in your lab. He's starting as a graduate student. Before. Yes, yeah, I'm very excited for him. We were talking about that earlier today. Um, okay. So yeah, we have and we have a lot of overlap with um, our our efforts and with faculty. Um, Dr. Schnetzer being one of the many. Um, we've had some faculty come and talk about their work and just kind of you know not persuade us but inspire us to look into research and really make a difference. Yeah, I would say indirectly in many ways. Mm -hmm. okay. I have you in class. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. yeah, I was going to uh, mention, yeah. <laughs> um, I think they're doing an excellent job bridging some of the field experience we can offer mm -hmm. in our curriculum and then taking it to the next level and using the faculty to network and going all the way down to Moorhead City. Um, Will told me a little bit, and you guys are just taking the rain and going for it. You should definitely present at the MES annual symposium. Oh yeah, I gotta talk to people about and that. talk to Will about that soon. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good way to to advertise. Um, yeah, I wish I had had a marine science club when I was younger. Um, I think it's a great way to to just have a voice and get heard. Okay, I like it. Yes. So one question I do have sort of along that line is, has the Marine Science Club had any interaction with like business majors or anything like that? Actually, I would probably have to check our membership to be sure. But, um, so we may have a few business majors in our club. Um, we have quite a few. We've gotten quite a lot of interest, but we only have um, a few small active members just because with time constraints and stuff like that. Um, but we haven't done any direct work with the um, business school at all. But that would be something interesting to look into, especially after going to that workshop. And, you know, I don't know a lot about business. I don't know a lot about the economy, but going there made me realize how interconnected it could be. Do you have ideas and suggestions? Yeah. Well, uh, as a, I'm a, um, I'm actually an Atlantic Beach local, so it's right next to, oh, okay. It's right next to Moorhead City in Beaufort. Mm -hmm. And I do, um, I see a lot of like environmental, like in person, I see a lot of environmental impact stuff because I um, usually surf Oceanside of Shackford mm -hmm. and um, a small little local spot um, off the hook of Cape Lookout called Shark Island. And usually I do see a lot, I do see a lot of runoff there, a lot of junk. I like, I think one time I've even seen like an EC unit washed up on this sandbar. And, um, I've got a picture on my phone, but one thing is, uh, like, as a business major, I've looked into, uh, I've looked into going into UNCW as a marine science major. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how feasible it was as a career for me, but I'm trying right now to find that mix between business and because um, it's an interest that's been me on. Yeah, I think there's plenty of opportunities, like we just heard. Yeah, it's 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 not all Jacques Cousteau and exploration. There's a lot of applied and transferable knowledge that goes to the ocean, not just coastal, but just generally. Yeah. Well, well and 
Professor Martin, you might comment on the tension on forestry and business is a huge issue. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to the South. So the sort of industrial uh, forestry that we have here, I'm, I'm still becoming familiar with. Um, but absolutely, there's a real, um, a real tension between sort of production and conservation that I think doesn't always have to exist if we had better communication between the two groups. I think that actually that there's a lot that we could all have in common, um, but but I think we need a lot more people who are able to bridge that gap and who are conversant in both languages, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think definitely having, having people who have experience in both is really valuable. Um, and we see even in the literature, there's things that ecologists now are writing about um, reforestation as if they sort of discovered that in forestry is sort of like, yeah, we've, we've been doing this for a hundred years, actually, you know, this is a standard you know, plantation management practice. Um, and now ecologists who are sort of doing plantations for restoration are sort of going like, oh, hey. Um, so I think that there's, there's all sorts of places for, for crossover there. I have a question. Go ahead. Yes, I've been I've been nudged into buying um, <laughs> uh, eco, like eco friendly yeah. <laughs> toilet paper and paper towels by going for bamboo. Is that real? Um, I mean, I think so. Probably what you're buying is probably FSC certified, which is there are there have been all these strategies, right, to think about how can we how can we promote conservation, right? So first was sort of protected areas. We're just going to keep people out. And then second was we'll kind of use neoliberal capitalism and have certification and make those products um, more expensive. And then that will give a premium and encourage people to use sustainable practices. And those results have been really, really mixed. They were mm -hmm. kind of designed initially for the tropics and because of a lot of barriers are not really being used in the tropics, but are being used a ton in temperate forests. So like oh, okay. Europe and Russia and the US has a lot of FSC certified products and a lot of plantations are FSC certified. So, but they, there are valuable standards that have to do with fair wages and all these different things. Um, so I think it's better than not having it. I, I fell for the argument that <laughs> yeah. it grows faster and <laughs> you don't take out the bigger trees. Yeah, uh -huh. I think that there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of creativity happening. I don't think any of these things are the magic bullet that they present themselves as. Is there sources that you can find where if you wanted to make a sustainable. ecosystem sustainable <laughs> decision and I needed, I don't know, a, a drawer or furniture? Where F FSC is a pretty solid FSC standard. Is good. There are you know, it's not perfect, but it what is. What does that stand for? That stands for the Forest Stewardship Council. So they have okay. a big list of criteria from environmental issues, human rights issues, economic, social, sustainability, okay. and people have to meet them. Um, all right, we'll all have to look that up. Forest yeah. Stewardship Conservation. Yeah, the Conservation. logo is FSC and it's sort of a little tree. Okay. And that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for, yeah, here we go. Since um, so I'm an international studies and business major, and to me, it's just you know, I've come to this session and I've learned so much, but I feel like this should be you know, common knowledge that maybe we should be using certain products at home, and these are ways that we can mitigate the adverse effects we kind of bring to the environment. What do you guys think about like on a university level, like integrating this into like our requirements for like let's say a class on sustainable development? Because I feel like a lot of people don't know about these things, and it's very easy to be, I don't know, anti environment when you don't even like, really know about it. I think that's an excellent idea. <laughs> it's also not straightforward. So like when we talk about, I, I'll go first if that's Please, okay, yeah. for, for when I teach biological oceanography, I alert people, for example, to uh, apps that tell you which fish choice or shellfish choice is environmentally feasible. Same, similar to the yeah. Forest um, Council, Forest Sustainability yeah. Council, and it will tell you that comes from agricultural or aquaculture, sorry, aquaculture sources that are not sustainable and whatnot. But actually really relying on these is, is I'm not an expert actually, I'm an expert on ecology and the oceans, but not in aquaculture. So I think what you're bringing up is an excellent point that it requires talk between specialists and getting the same language going in regard to what 
thing to really refer to and recommend wholeheartedly because it covers from the initial issue all the way to how we use the oceans, for example, or the forests. So I think it's a great, I, I just ask that question because I don't know. Right. Like I go for the eco-friendly first, but then, you know, if you dig deeper, it's like, so how do I rely on that? How do I believe that, right? right? So I think it's an excellent point. And yeah, I think there could be a standard across the university, right? Well, there is two things that I, I let me do a little commercial. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have a sustainability office and a sustainability council that does a lot of important work. And in fact, the sustainability awards are next week. Uh, so we have a very active uh, office in that regard. But something that's hot off the presses is that we have an SDG course database. And so if you want to take courses that are related to these topics, you have a source. And I, 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 before I start pulling it up and showing you, there is a source that you can search by college and you can search by SDG. So that's a great way to find. And a lot of them are indicated at their uh, GEPs. So you can pick courses that will maybe meet your GEP requirements, but that are focused on some of the sustainable development goals. So that's the two things that we've got going. And I, I would just jump in really quickly and say, I think it is great for us as individual consumers to try to make choices that are more sustainable. But you know, if we don't have a Clean Water Act, if we don't have state regulations saying, you know, when you're doing a logging operation, you have to protect X number of feet around waterways. Just passing that legislation is infinitely more powerful than anything that we can individually do in terms of buying good toilet paper. And so if we really want to address these problems, it, it honestly has to be through political action. There's just not a way that we're going to get there as individual consumers. The problems are way too big. Um, so it's tempting to say, oh, well, we just all need to, you know, use bamboo toilet paper and, and change our light bulbs and mm -hmm. go to the car wash, but like, that's not going to do it. And I, I forgot to make a plug in my presentation. I am also the new faculty advisor, which is why I've forgotten for the International uh, Society of Tropical Foresters, ISTF. It sounds very limited to forestry, but we are actually, um, broadly about kind of anything in the tropics. And so if anybody is interested in that, um, contact me and we do fun events and there's a conference every year at Yale that's really fun. Um, hopefully we'll be going back there in person eventually. So one more student organization for the on land folks to figure out. <laughs> so I just wanted to show, it's fantastic. That's great. Another student organization. I just want to show you guys what this looks like. So you can see pool, these are all courses that are related to uh, life below water. So that's an opportunity for you to find courses and you can see they're in all different kinds of departments or what have you. And similarly, if you say, well, I wanna look at the course inventory from um, a college perspective, I'm in business or whatever, you'll see you can browse it by college as well. So that's my commercial. <laughs> Thank you to our speakers. They did a great job. Thank you to our audience. If you're not graduating, uh, we, we look forward to seeing you uh, at some of our SDG at threes uh, in the fall. Have a great summer.